Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, a podcast that looks at the inspiration, intention, and actionable steps to help you jumpstart joy in the world, in your life, and in other people's lives. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 198. This week on the show, I'm really thrilled to have my friend and now fellow podcaster, Christy Tending, back on the show for her sixth visit. This is a brand new interview with her. She and I sometimes meet to co-work together at a local cafe, and um, it came up that we've both experienced evolution in our lives and the way that we are approaching our businesses over the last few months. And so that conversation was the starting point uh, for what then became this episode. And I'm really excited to share it with you because as you know, Christy and I met, uh, she joined me early in season one. And since then we have become fast friends. It's very interesting to see the ongoing parallels that she and I have in our lives and in our businesses as we grow and evolve. And so it's interesting at the end of season four here, that she and I are back and we're talking about that evolution and the way that we both called BS on some of the things that we saw in our lives and in some of the things that we saw going on in our businesses. It's also really exciting because we do talk about how those things are so interwoven. Um, I'm really excited to have her on as we get to the end here of season four. If you're new to Jumpstart Your Joy, I want to give you a big warm welcome and say thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you want to find out more about the show, you can find the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com and you can find more information there all about the inspiration, intention, and action of bringing more joy to your daily life. And if you want to find the show notes for this particular episode, along with the links of the past five episodes that Christy and I have done together, you can find it at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash evolve. I also want to give Christy a very big congratulations and virtual high fives all around. Because in this last week on Friday, she launched her very own podcast, which is called Tending Your Life. If you like Christy, and I know you guys do, you are going to just love her show. She has done an amazing job of breaking down some basic tenets of self-care, self-advocacy, and how you can do a deep dive on those things in your life. And she includes action points at the end of every show, which is just so good. I'm very much loving it and also producing her show. So (laughs) I have the inside sneak peek. I know you guys are going to love the entire season. It is so good. So you can find that at Tending Your Life, or you can go to christytending.com forward slash podcast. So without further ado, here is my dear friend, Christy Tending. Hello, yes. beautiful. Hello, how are you? I am really good. I'm I'm in it today, as we talked about before yeah. this started, and as we talked about yesterday, because I'm lucky to get to talk to you like a lot of days, <laughs> these days. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really in the thick of it, but I'm also really good. Uh, yeah, I I can understand that. And I appreciate that you can see both sides of it, that we can all do this work, meaning whatever work it is that we do in this world and also be, hey, yeah, it's kind of hard to move some mountains or or create new things or question authority. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And I love you for it. Oh, um, I love you too. Aww. I mean, we should start talking because otherwise we're just going to be like, I love you for I this know. whole episode. It's going to be super sweet. Um, so those of you who, I don't know how it'd be possible, but that don't know Christy, (laughs) she and I met through this podcast and have become dear friends. And it is always a delight because we kind of started our businesses and our path to becoming ass kickers and entrepreneurs uh, around the same time. And so it's always really cool to get to check in and talk about the things that we see both in our lives and in the businesses that we are creating. And so it seemed like a great time at the end of season four. Also knowing what Christy's been brewing (laughs) um, for all of us uh, to kind of check in and see where we are and how things are going. So I know one of the things we talked about before we hit the record button here around was Christy and I have been talking a bit about habits and how we can see ourselves in process or in building things or in doing things in this life in a new way and how there's been an evolution of sorts for both of us 
in the last year or so that feels new and exciting. And I don't know if you want to share a bit about how you're experiencing that and, and I'll jump in and play along as well. Yeah. So the last year has been just full of change in virtually every realm of my life, <laughs> which is which is sort of the way things go for me. I'm I'm either in a holding pattern and everything's sort of set in every realm, or I'm the person who's changing everything all at the same time. So the last, I would say, six or eight months has been just full of changes and full of evolution, as you put it. And the three things that kind of pop for me are, first of all, in my business, the time that y'all are going to be listening to this episode last week, uh, I will have launched the new version of my website, um, a bunch of new offerings, including my new podcast. It's so funny to be talking about that in the past when it's happening in the future. Um, <laughs> We've got a little back to the future I'm, thing I'm going really, on. <laughs> I'm really like speaking it into being. It's an incredible experience. Um, so my new website is there for you. I have a bunch of new offerings over there. The podcast is in the world. Also, several months ago, I decided to quit drinking. I, as I've said to people many, many times, I'm not ever the person you would have looked at and said, wow, she really has a problem. It was not that. It was simply, it was really getting in the way of my ability to be as wholeheartedly myself in the world. And I really decided that that BS needed to end with me and it needed to end right now. My kiddo has gone from being a baby to a toddler and is now in preschool. And that evolution for me as a parent has been super interesting to let go a lot and still be present in supporting him because he's two, but really inviting so much non-attachment and so much letting go and so much allowing in for him to, you know, strike out on his own and make friends and be in the world. So it's been just full of evolution recently <laughs> for me. Yeah. I, I it's it's like a train coming down the tracks and I just can't I can't stop it. It's like Yeah. Oh, here's this other thing for me to evolve. Yeah. Well and I love that you're embracing it because it I mean I think, you know, we all make choices and then some people, you don't see them step up and say yes to it, right? Like they just go, oh, I don't know what that is, you know, but I feel like there's this really interesting trajectory that you have that you, you do wake up and say yes. And then you just, like you said, you can't, you can't look away from it. You grab on and make it happen. It's not just something that happens to you. You also make it happen. Well, I think that that is the perfect meshing together of my activist background and my yoga meditation background, mm, which is yeah. like you see injustice and you choose not to look away or you're in meditation and you are choosing over and over again to come back to this present moment. And regardless of which of those vehicles you choose, I think my whole thing has always been, how do you show up fully? Yeah. Especially when you know evolution is probably inevitable. I mean, change is the only constant. <laughs> and so I think, yeah, it is how do we step in and get comfortable with it and also see that there is that desire, I think, in both of your sides right there, there's that desire for to be more. If it's to be more present in the example of meditation, or is it to be more present in doing the good thing in the world that you know is possible? It's the desire for more. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, my whole thing has always been let go or be dragged. Like, <laughs> so, and there have definitely been times in my life where I've been like, sure, being dragged sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in general, I think that that letting go, that embracing the evolution has been a much more pleasant approach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I would like, it seems that you, are enjoying it on the one on the one hand very much and that it's like I think we both in this season that sounds a little coachy or whatever but in this season we've both said oh my gosh I can see all these things clicking into a place where I'm like 
ooh, now I'm kind of ready for whatever that next thing is. And and I think it has come across in our personal lives. I know it has in the discussions we've had, but it's also really, it's almost like we're in that place in a business and in our personal life where what we have been doing is no longer either serving us or okay, or in some cases acceptable. And so we're ready to do the next thing. And it's almost with excitement and anticipation that we're like, ooh, what happens if? And I'm kind of thinking, I guess, around the space of a discussion we had around like, I'm sick and tired of feeling like I'm just sitting here waiting for the other shoe to drop on things. So I'm just, I'm saying, no, thank you. We're doing something else. And I'm not holding space for that anymore. But I don't know, you know, are there some spaces where you feel like that's happened too, where you're like, I'm just not, or I am just doing something different. Well, it's so funny. I'm thinking back to that conversation that we had where you showed up for coffee and you're like, I'm done waiting for the other shoe to drop. And, <laughs> and it was the first time I'd seen you after I quit drinking. And I, I feel like the conversation, the things that we were both dealing with and we were both were both coming up for us is this idea that we were done being victims of circumstance. Oh, Yes. And, totally. <laughs> and being dragged along in this way that like was not working for either one of us anymore. Right. It was like our, our state for you, it was like an internal state. And for me, it was like a physical state. Mm-hmm. Like that wasn't working for either one of us anymore. And we were like, we are too smart and powerful and awesome to be <laughs> victims of these circumstances anymore. This is not working. It's not acceptable. And And even if it were tolerable, both of us know that we deserve more than to feel like this for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So why don't we cut this out right now? (laughs) And there was this both of us seeing like, I'm calling bullshit on this. It was almost like there was this waking up of, I mean, and not that we weren't aware of this or separate, but but kind of similar situations where it was like we were going along as if this was kind of just how things are. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, this is bullshit. I don't like how this feels. I don't like how I'm acting, at least for my, you know, for myself. I'm speaking for right. myself. And then it was like, no, I'm done with it. Like, it, this is just over. Like, I can't act anymore as if the other shoe's about to drop. And if listeners aren't kind of familiar with what that might mean or how it was playing out for me, I felt like my family, so things are good. Like, that is a truth. That's, I'm, I'm not, that's not me saying the things are good, but it's just the fact of the matter is things are good. But I felt like there was this undercurrent of anxiety slash stress slash I don't know what else of things could go sideways on us at any moment. Now, I don't have any repetitive history or proof that that's a possibility. Like, No, things actually have just been on a trajectory of good and well and things lined up. But it was almost like I was afraid to to breathe too much into that because what if? And I just got tired of it because when I'm operating from that space, I mean, we could go real woo on this, but I'm not going to manifest the other things that are good because part of my brain and my belief is back in the space where, well, it could go bad at any minute. And it was like, I was holding my breath constantly and I was just done with it. Like, and things have shifted very differently since I decided that was over. Like, you know, today I woke up and decided I'm done nagging my kid to get ready because I decided I was tired of feeling like I always nag him. Well, who's, who's at stake there? <laughs> me. <Right. laughs> let me call my own bullshit again. Like, I was like I'm done. let me point you in the direction of whose problem that is. <laughs> right. It's not my kid who doesn't want to put on his pants. It's the mom who's nagging him. <laughs> well, and, and so much of that is like, he's not, not putting on his pants at you. So like, <laughs> hey, and it always comes so you can to decide pants. to take it less personally anytime you want, my friend. <laughs> I'm done. So I'm not nagging anymore. Oh. But yeah, okay. I feel like I just went off. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about kind of how you arrived that day and we were both in that same space as well. Because I think, you know, other circumstances might be really interesting to listeners who are like, wait, what are you saying? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so interesting because I I really do think that, for instance, my decision to quit drinking is a very political one. First of all, I politicize everything in my life because I think that the personal is political. But for me, it was like I am not here to on this planet, in this world, in this lifetime, to be a good little consumer. I'm not here to like 
be cute and drink whiskey. Like that's not my purpose in this world. And there was, there is enough evidence in my lineage and without violating my family's privacy, I will just say there is enough evidence in my family's lineage to point me toward the truth that even if I do not have quote unquote, what anyone else would consider to be a problem, I still didn't have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I was still allowing myself to be victimized by society's narratives that drinking makes you cute and attractive and fun and all of these things. And instead, I found myself like sabotaging myself through continuing this habit that wasn't serving me. I was basically fueling the fire of my ongoing anxiety and depression. And I was betraying the truth that I know, which is that I am not here to be a good little consumer. I am not here to follow anybody else's path. I am here to make change in this world. I am here to experience our intrinsic interconnection. And I can't do that if I'm still drinking. And I also understood, and again, this is why it feels so political to me, in the same way that I am a climate activist, in the same way that I have a strong anti-racist practice, I will not say that I've rid myself of racism because I don't think that's a thing that white people can necessarily achieve. We don't get stickers or cookies for this. But as somebody who is trying to undo that internal conditioning, Mm -hmm. I can either clean this up now with the climate, with racism, with my drinking, with any other habits. I can either start cleaning this shit up now or I can leave this for my kid to deal with. Yeah. And that is not an acceptable option for me. Yes. It is it is not acceptable to me th- for me to leave my child with a broken planet. It is not acceptable to me to pass down this lineage of drinking. It's not acceptable to me to continue to pass down unchecked racism to my child. Right. And and that's really where the rubber meets the road for me. Is like what am I doing with my life? that I'm going to be passing down to my child. And I think it takes such a strong sense of self and sense of presence and really getting to that space of realizing, and and, and I feel myself doing the same thing with my son as well. And for listeners, he's eight, so he's a he's a little older than than Christy's kiddo. Um, but <laughs> we're in I feel different like, phases of yeah, parenting. We're different phases, so if we're talking about it a little bit differently, that's, that, that helps align with that. But like... I find it really important that I am explaining to him about how I see racism and how it's had roots in our all of our past and how you know how do we approach anyone who is different and I mean I'll just say it I don't think we've even talked about it so this 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 might be really interesting but like Ooh. how do we approach this world as people uh, you know, with a heritage of being Caucasian slash white, and how do how can we break the break down things that we know are not right and that we can see people doing, and what is our role as we walk through this world, and what is our responsibility as we walk through this world to help dismantle that in our choices, in how we speak, like we get into it in this house, <laughs> yeah, and. and- I feel like it's our like my responsibility because this is the next generation. And just like what you've said, I'm not okay handing this off and being like, oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> like this country, we're doing it good. Like it's not yeah, true. And, and the other thing I'm super not okay with is like avoiding those conversations out of a sense of like politeness or oh, of like goodness. oh, we, yeah. we don't we don't have those conversations. And no. And I feel really grateful, you know, to my parents because we had these conversations when I was a kid and I, as an adult, am still having these conversations with them and they are from a different generation. So there are still Mm -hmm. areas where it's like a foregone conclusion to me to have a particular perspective and that's a growth edge for them. Yeah. And I feel really lucky that like they did the work that they did in order to evolve and that they're still willing to kind of look at things and to evolve and to recognize that they're not, they're, they're not there yet. 
in some areas. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to my kiddo doing that for me (laughs) because there are, there are certainly things that I'm sure that I'm not seeing things that in 20, 30 years are going to be completely obvious to him Right. That I'm going to need an education on. And I think that that's, that's part of the evolution piece also is it's never ending. Yeah, <laughs> it isn't. And it's, it, I mean, the creation here, not to go s- totally spiritual on it, but just the creation is never going to be perfect. I mean, we can all, wor- we can all work to it. And that's like the highest thing that I feel like I can do here is that place of purpose where everyone's equal. And I know you would say that, you know, where everyone's free, like we can all be free and that's what we're working towards. But I think we have to be aware that it isn't perfect now, (laughs) but part of my duty is to like help this little person usher him in as having an awareness of, of, of what it means to be who he is and how that impacts other people. Cause it's just, yeah, it's kind of, it's amazing to see that you or I, or anyone in our situation could just be like, it's all good. This can continue. But that's, that in my opinion is not true. It can't continue this way. There's some injustices, a lot of them (laughs) that I'm not okay with it in the world. Yeah. And what's interesting to me to sort of bring it back to the evolution with my business is that I am now having conversations talking about things like in my podcast, in my work, even in the way that I'm labeling myself on my website. Yeah. That's like, this is bold. And I'm going to be honest with you. I am pretty sure that I'm going to lose some people over this. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Like, that's totally fine. That's totally great. There's not actually a dearth of life coaches in this world. (laughs) So people, so if this isn't right for them, people are going to find the right person for them. And so I Mm, feel totally great about being like, yeah, be free. (laughs) Go find (laughs) who you're meant to be with. Because the shrinking myself, the being polite, the, the saying things just a certain way, the like talking around issues instead of talking about them. I'm I'm just feeling super done. I think part of it is that I have a two-year-old and I didn't sleep great during my pregnancy. So we're closing in on like three years of not great sleep, yeah. which means that my filter is toast. <laughs> I'm, and I'm just not interested in having the pretty conversations tied up in a bow anymore. And for the people who I've been working with since the start of my business, the ones who have read all my eBooks and taken all my courses, I've got people who I know are like really with me and I owe it to them to be like, okay, here's what's next. It's interesting on several levels there because people evolve, all of us, right? And so I think it's really outstanding when we get to watch someone that maybe we've followed for a really long time and watch them evolve. And like, there's something really inspirational but see what they're going through in their life and how they react to it. I think it's just indicative. Maybe this is so obvious, but it's like a mirror of what all of us go through in different ways. So I, I got to say, I don't think that a lot of people be totally surprised, you know, that business has changed and that the, the point of view changes to a certain extent. Or is it just how people are talking about their point of view? They're finally comfortable enough. Because I feel like that's kind of part of my trajectory. I always thought this stuff, but now it's okay to say it. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is like on my new website, I am I label myself as a Buddhist and I label myself as the anarchist. And the fact is I've been both of those things for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. And neither one of those means that I'm a different person than I was before. It just means that I'm putting in my mind a more accurate label yeah. on those things and that I'm going to be talking about things in a more explicit way. Mm-hmm. And here's the other thing. <laughs> I've always made tons of space in my work for people to disagree with me. So they're yeah. still allowed to do that. Like there's no need to like buy into every single thing that I believe in order for us to like play together and work together and like hang out and be best buds. Yeah. Because if and- I only hung out with people who like believed everything that I believe, it'd be like, me and my dude and my cats. And that would be a very small life. (laughs) Well, and I think there's a growth edge there for every person as they evolve. It's like, 
if you just hung out with the people like you, then you're just in an echo chamber, right? Like even that's the danger of the Facebook algorithm and all that. Like it's oh, yeah. great it's, to it's, know. It's why that- I left Facebook. It was like, it was the same like eight people over and over again. And I was like, I already know what this person thinks about this. I'm good. <laughs> right. And part of it for me in terms of evolution is about studentship. And I, I actually said this on a call that I was hosting for one of my courses yesterday I was like, none of you who are taking this course right now would still be with me if I had decided like three years ago that I already knew everything I needed to know about these issues and had quit evolving, quit learning, quit practicing, quit investigating in my life. Mm -hmm. You all, if I'd been like, so here's all that I know and that's that. (laughs) All all of you would have been like, great, we're out of (laughs) here. (laughs) <laughs> and so I so I think that there's an important piece to being a lifelong student and allowing ourselves to be teachable. Yeah. Allowing yeah. ourselves to be in that place of like, I am evolving and I do not know. Yeah. I think that's powerful. I mean, obviously, I, to me it is. And uh, I mean, it's also calling in a, in a, beautiful way in a way of examples it's like kind of calling bullshit on anyone who's like i'm a guru no you're not like (laughs) anyone who describes themselves as a guru (laughs) is someone i run from immediately (laughs) but but i have teachers and i rely on their expertise when i decided to quit drinking one of the very first things i did was that i texted a longtime teacher of mine she's been a yoga teacher and mentor of mine for many years and I texted her and was like hello Mm -hmm. and so she's also sober she's like sober sister which is important context and I texted her and was like hello I have quit drinking I'm okay and feeling very functional in this so far but any thoughts you got for me like you've been doing this a while like what you got yeah (laughs) and The absolute most amazing thing that she did was that she directed me to her teacher. Mm, And she said, here's an audio meditation from one of my teachers. She goes on retreat with this person and she says, do this meditation with him every day for 40 days. Mm. And I love that because it really points to we're all evolving. We're all works in progress. Even the, the person who's like my mentor in so many areas is like, I don't have a thing for you, but here's what my, my teacher has. Yeah. And I, to me, it was like, oh, this is why I study with this person. This is why this person is my mentor is because she's committed to studentship. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, it is a very serious commitment to remain in the, I'm not sure, but I'm going to find out for you. And the, we're all figuring this out together kind of space to me, that's it's really important. Right. And and I see the through line there of like having a deep appreciation and a deep sense of this is somebody that's in it, you know, just like I'm in it. They don't think they're done learning. (laughs) There's no pretense here that like there's some sort of absolute knowledge or a quest for the absolute that means you'd be done (laughs) at some point figuring it out. Like, I think there's something really beautiful when people can be present in their vulnerability with you because it shows like, yeah, I see you and we're kind of mirroring each other and we can be in this together. Does it drop the sense of there's judgment when somebody can be vulnerable with you? Yeah. And just acknowledging that we're all in our own process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing is regardless of whether something, somebody shares this with you or not, we're all in our own process. Every single person you meet is in process, is in evolution probably. And so then the question is, okay, so if that's true for everybody, Mm -hmm. then the, then the only question is like, share it, don't share it. Yeah. And there are tons of reasons not to share your process privacy and family and it's too tender so far and all of that. And I probably err on the side of like, I'm like a share bear. I'm like, I'm (laughs) here's what's up. (laughs) And, and that's kind of the side that I err on. But at the same time, if we're all in process, if that's true for literally all of us, yeah, then the only question is like, share it and potentially empower someone potentially 
help someone feel the tiniest bit less alone or don't share it. Right. Yeah. And I think I'm also one of the over, well, I'm just a transparent type person, like clearly podcast high, like (laughs) it's not going to work to hide out somewhere else with things. So yeah. Is there a step there each time of I'm aware of my stuff? I'm processing my stuff, I share my stuff, and then it happens again. Like, so it's always like you're plateauing up kind of, or just into a different realm. I I don't want to make it like there's a hierarchy of, of evolution necessarily, but like that we each become comfortable with our shit. And then we say, oh yeah, I've kind of processed through that. And now I'm going to share it with other people. But I, at least in my own process, have to be aware of it, process, and then I can share Yeah. And I think that, you know, sharing just to share, as Brene Brown said in her most recent talk, it's on Netflix. She said, you know, live tweeting your bikini wax, not vulnerable. Like, so there's a certain amount of like sharing just to share isn't, isn't necessarily going to help anybody. No, but I think there really is something to remaining a student and sharing what our studentship looks like. I agree. On a regular basis. And I I think I think that that's that's the direction I'm pointing myself towards. Yes, there are new things that I have to say and things that I want to share and resources that I want to create and all of that. This is like the first time I'm saying this out loud, but I really think that for me the the evolution of my work is to show up in my studentship as wholeheartedly as possible. Mm, yeah. And to say, okay, this is what this looks like. This is this is what this is like for me right now. And 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 to and to make that not knowing thing okay. Oh, yes. Cuz I think particularly for activists, like we have a life is already kind of so heartbreaking and uncertain that then if we walk around and we're like, well, I'm not really sure about this. That that kind of feels extra difficult somehow. Yeah. It's like life is a heartbreaking mess and I don't know. But I think that this like, how do I show up and be a good student? How do I show up and evolve for future generations, even if I'm doing it imperfectly? Yeah. How do I make sure that that next generation maybe has to deal with like 5% less of the bullshit in the world? And I, I think that that for me is like where it's at. That's like where the party is these days. I like very much how you've put that because I can also see that being in that space of not knowingness, I think is so totally vulnerable. And as you were saying that about kind of an activist set, maybe not being, well, I'll put it in this way, like it's hard to be an activist and also admit maybe I don't know all the stuff or people don't know all the stuff. And I think the project management set is the same way or the kind of the life coaching set is the same way too. Like all of those groups of people are, I think universally it's deeply uncomfortable to feel like I don't know all the steps to this project, (laughs) but I'm going to write down what I know and we'll get on with it. But like, I don't know. It's interesting to put that lens on things of like, we're all in our studentship. And so where is that balance of, I can present outwardly and act as if, yes, I am confident in my abilities and my experience and, and knowing what will happen next. Yes, I got that. But there's right. also that unending, open-ended piece of things, which is totally undefinable. <laughs> and we're going to have to move forward, you know? Yeah. Know, and it's a really interest, it's an interesting balance. And those of us who have been activists for a long time, you know, we're having this conversation about like, okay, what's really going to tip the balance here? Mm, yeah. Like, what's it, what's it really going to take? And, you know, for a lot of us, like, I remember the good old days of being an activist under Clinton. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that was a whole different world, man. Like, yeah, do, doing it, the, do, doing it these days, is like, wait, what? It's, it's like the Hunger Games. Like you can, you're playing in all different fields and there's always a question of like, okay, what is really going to tip the scales here? What mm-hmm. do we need to do? How do we need to up level? What do we need to learn? How do we need to grow? And one of the things that I think activism does really beautifully and Buddhism does really beautifully also is we, in each of those realms, we're relying on community. In Buddhism, we call it the Sangha. In activism in my world, we call it community and mutual aid, solidarity. But we can say, I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. And then we can say, but we're going to figure this out together because we have each other. Yeah. We're not alone in any of them. And going and meditating in a room full of people, I did it just a couple of days ago at my spiritual home. There's power in that. The mm-hmm. same way that I, I can show up totally dejected at the world. And if I show up to a political meeting full of my good friends with whom I've been working for more than 10 years, most of them, and we say, okay, here's this opportunity. What are we going to do? Let's figure this out together. I never walk into that room feeling the burden of having to have all the answers. Yeah. If I acted like I had all the answers, everyone would call bullshit on me because they're like, <laughs> dude, we know you. <laughs> right. And and also it's just not necessary. We can rely on each other. We can rely on community and they're going to have our backs when we don't have the answers. When we're still in that kind of like messy evolution stage, there are people with whom I do activism who like have loved me since I was a larva. Like mm-hmm. they're totally down for my like, for my learning curve. <laughs> and it's a really good thing because I'm never, ever going to stop learning. I think that's a really, that's a, a lovely thing to like point out and notice about having the people around you that will hold space for you to be whoever it is that you are and, and in whatever stage you are, because I, I'm reflecting on some of the places where I've felt like people, if I was wearing the title of project manager, were looking to me to know everything. And then like, I can see what happens on the opposite of it. It's like, then somehow you have to have the answers. And of course, you don't have all of them. And they put you in a space where then it's kind of a no-win situation. And then, of course, they get mad at you. <laughs> like that's simplified, really boiled down. But I can see how that plays out when, you know, when anyone thinks there's an absolute in play, then it's really not going to work out too well. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, absolutes are nobody's friend. And really, I think that value in community is is really essential to growth. This is, I think, part of why I could like never go get a corporate job is like, I'd be so confused. Like if I couldn't go ask everybody else for help, if I couldn't Mm, rely on the, the knowledge of the room to come to, like if I was expected to kind of be out on my own and just figure everything else uh, f- figure everything out by myself. I like. I'd be really confused and kind of scared. I just. It's like this is why I just couldn't hack it because I'd be like, <laughs> I have no idea what your people are talking about. <laughs> Wait, yes, exactly. And and so for me, the ability to yeah, I run my own business and I'm doing a lot of things myself. But I also just I have tons of help. I have my teachers. I have my buddies like you. <laughs> yes, and. You know, I have my friends and family who I bounce stuff off of. And then I have the strength of spiritual community and political community Mm -hmm. that are kind of there for me no matter what. And again, I I really don't know what I'd do if I didn't have that. I'd I'd just be very confused. (laughs) I know there was a point in time in my own spiritual community where we would lead retreats together, which is amazing. And I love it. And then as time went by, people left the team, which they do. And that's, you know, with total love, I I appreciate each of them that they had something else they needed to do with their life and their purpose. And so they would, they would leave the team. And pretty soon it was just three of us and it was never the same. And in the space of trying to create something, the creation for me always would come from it being a team effort and a community effort. Like we're creating for a community, but we're also a community that creates. So I'm sure there's some really great parallels between kind of the activist community and any community that's creating something for someone else, but it isn't a solo activity. (laughs) No. And it gets lonely and weird. And I don't feel like it's fully thought through if I can't pull in others and bounce the ideas off of other people. And so I don't, I don't know that I'd really put that lens on it before. So thank you for your insight about your community as well. I think it's, it's imperative. And that's probably why sometimes the project management role felt really lonely because there isn't a community about it. Well, this is why I'm so wary of anyone who calls themselves guru and why I like don't want to be one. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, man, we're doing this work here together. Like, let me assure you. And it's why, you know, whenever I teach a course, I'm always doing the course alongside my students. And I'm kind of yes. sharing with like stuff that comes up and things that 
are I'm studying in my practice and kind of weaving them in and like, okay, here's what my teacher says about this. And here's what my mentor has to say about this other thing and making sure that I'm, I'm never like going at this Mm -hmm. from only my own perspective, because that would be a disservice to my students, but also making sure that as they are trusting me with their studentship, I'm trusting them with mine. I just feel like it it would be a very unhappy path for me. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And it's really striking me that the next episode after this one is with Sister Michelle, who is a Franciscan nun. And I think a lot of it, of what we're kind of grappling with here is, is that it's something that I see her and her community really do well, which is they are an example of a teachership that very much honors the past that brought them to where they are. And by that, I mean like, you know, other scholars and they're deeply in, involved in scholarship. And it's just really beautiful to see how that can play out. And it's very much a different example than one might see in a lot of the social media guru circles or like internet startup, I know what I'm doing. So, you know, it's this, it's an easier, more inviting way of approaching leadership. So how did it get that there's like these people up on pedestals? I don't get it. Well, and this is where the anarchist in me would tell you that hierarchy is inherently damaging. And this is where the Buddhist in me would tell you that hierarchy creates unnecessary suffering by erecting this facade, this illusion of separateness between us. Yes. Oh, yes. That and, illusion of separateness is definitely something throughout, you know, other religions as well, that it, you are not separate from the divine. You are one with the, the divine. Well, and also, I think that there's this illusion that there are these layers of hierarchy in between us and the divine. Yeah. Oh, or yeah. in the or in the case of like the our political work between us and our power. It's the same. It's the same thing, basically. Yeah. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody. This was probably six years ago. Um, I was talking um, was in a small group of people and we were talking about a protest that I had recently coordinated. And somebody in the group asked me, oh, how did you find out about that protest, that event? And I looked at him and we had this sort of, I described it as like a, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do I mean? sort of mm-hmm. a moment. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, what do you mean? What do I mean? Like, how did you find out about it? And I was like, find out about it. Like, we just decided, man, like our group just decided we were doing this. And he was, and, it, and like the look on his face was so amazing. Cause he was like, wait, you can just decide to do stuff. I was like, oh man, the <laughs> amount of stuff that I just decide to do, <laughs> right. you would be amazed. Yeah. And, and I think that's I think that's probably why I have to run my own business is I don't want to do what other people are telling me to do. I just want to have an idea for cool stuff and then I want to go do it. And and I think that what he was experiencing was like, you're allowed. And I was like, I was like, oh man, they're so they're allowed is a myth. Like mm-hmm. I think I posted on Instagram recently. I was like, you are a grown adult who is allowed to do whatever you want as long as you are not hurting people. And I think that we get caught up in a like, oh, politics have to happen through this very specific channel, through this very specific conduit. And if we're not doing it in that particular way, then we don't have access. And the fact is, I could just decide to go and block an intersection this afternoon. It yeah. wouldn't be safe and it wouldn't be a great idea strategically, <laughs> but, but I'm allowed to go do whatever I want. The consequences are mine, but I don't need anybody's permission. And I think that that connects with both the spiritual of what we're talking about in terms of like, we have this community and we have access to to the divine whenever we decide we want to claim it. And yes. similarly in politics, like we have access to our own power anytime we decide we want it. I'm sure there is a, you know, a slice of listenership that's like, that is deeply uncomfortable to think that I can just do. Like, oh, wait yeah. a minute. We all like, that's, that's the Zen moment of anything is that permission required to do the thing you want to do. And do that's why the first rule of podcasting is your own damn show. And you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Like there aren't rules, get that out of your head. And then let's start from wherever that is for you. Because I mean, yeah, your cover art has to be a certain size or Apple will say no thanks. But other than that, like, no, do your show, do your thing. Um, I, yeah, it's amazing to see how 
people, as one client used to say to me, get wrapped around the axle on this because it's just... And people it's, get uncomfortable watching other people do it too. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. I mean, all we have to do is look at Colin Kaepernick and the fact that he's not playing professional football and look at the fact that, like, we are very uncomfortable when people just decide to do stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That, well, and that, is, that is super uncool for a lot of people still. And again, like, for this person I was talking to where he was like, wait, you just decided that you were going to go do that thing? And I was like, oh, yeah, we just decide stuff all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, there's no, there's no, like, intricate decision-making structure. It's like me and, like, two of my friends were like, we should do this thing. And then we're like, okay, let's figure out how to do the thing. Yeah, well, and that's where the magic happens. I mean... It's totally where the magic happens. I gotta say, like, that... I love that nugget of like, yeah, we're just going to do it. Ness. Like, because that's how, that's how this whole show started was I'm like, well, I don't know how, but I'm just going to freaking figure it out. Let's do it. Like, <laughs> wait, I, you know, nobody told me I could have one. I just said, yes, I'm going to, I guess part of once you've opened that door to like, you can figure it out and you have every right to do it. I feel like you can, there's no going back. <laughs> Like once you've tried, like you put your toe in, then you like are like, oh, what else is possible here? This is the nugget of this podcast episode is like <laughs> your trust of authority and love of community. <laughs> well, and that allowed is a myth. <laughs> oh, a- allowed is so a myth. Like, and and it's funny because I do put things like in my ebooks and in my courses. It's like here is your permission slip to, and every time I do it, I like feel really uncomfortable because I'm like. This isn't a thing. This is this is like giving a kid like a participation tro- trophy. Like this is such an artifice. But some people really do need to hear it through that lens. And so for those people, like I put the phrasing in because I'm like here, mm-hmm. like I'm this magnanimous leader who's like here have this <laughs> thing. But it but it really is it's it's artifice entirely. And mm. um, so if if you are one of my students and you're listening to this, like just know that. You, you already actually have blanket permission to do whatever you want anytime. <laughs> and you already had it. Like there's the you other already, Yeah, you already Zen had moment. it. That's such yeah. a great way of putting it. You're like, yeah, you've had you've had the permission slip all along. Yeah. Mmm. It gets so matrixy. <laughs> it it does get it does get so matrixy. Oh man, the, the things that you have permission to do that you haven't even dreamt of, it's like if if somebody had told me like two years ago, if somebody just walked up to me on the street and told me two years ago, you have permission to stop drinking, I would have been like, you are high. No, I don't. This mm. is this is the way my life is. And oh my gosh, how disempowering to myself. Yeah. Like what Ooh, a dis- what a what a disservice to believe that. I'm thinking that the thing I didn't feel I had permission to do was to stop being a full time project manager. I really, I it was like shackles in a way that yeah. seems very strong, but I felt tied to it. Like I couldn't just give it up. And guess what? I did, and I'm good. <laughs> like everything, the world's still turning. You guys are still listening. Like. It was very possible, and yet it felt totally like that wasn't a thing that I could I could do. Well, you've hit on the problem, well, one of many problems with capitalism, which is that if you are good at something and it's lucrative, mm-hmm. yes. you're told that you're supposed to do that until you drop. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of, like, we could awkward, go. Awkward, but again, you're allowed to just stop doing the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and oh, this is like a whole nother episode birthing itself. I can feel it. But like, there's something, maybe this is more of a focus for season five, but like there is the myth of you need to do it. You need to do more of it and you need to amass as much of the wealth or the benefits or whatever it is as you can until you can't anymore. Like there is a big pressure to do that. And I am I, there's something really beautiful about saying, you know what? I want time to go hang out with my son. I want time to just go make copies at school because there's, I want to help his teacher because there's help. Like I love helping. There's community. It makes me happy. Those are all benefits of something that have nothing to do with money. And I am happy for what I do make and and grateful for it. And there is also another thing that is um, a currency in my life. And that that was really hard to own and say yes to and be be okay with because that it's really easy to get on that trajectory where you're like, yes, capitalism. And then, but wait, there's more. 
<laughs> I'm not okay with just this capitalist shit. Well, and, you know, if you look at the people who continually, endlessly, bottomly amass wealth and consume resources, there's exploitation in there somewhere. I guarantee you. Mm, yeah. Jeff Bezos can have as many billion dollar, billions of dollars as he wants, and those Amazon warehouse workers are not living their best lives. So mm. that, I think, to me, is like a major part of it is like, you can do that, but like, man, at whose expense? Yeah. Yeah. And that hits deep because even this last with the last month, like Zach and I were driving up the five, which is a highway in California. And when you go up central California, you can see oh, right yeah. outside there is there is a lot out there that was seriously disturbing to me. Two of them were the Amazon warehouses, which were sitting right outside the major metropolitan areas. This, I mean, for some reason, I had like made this pretty and like somehow, oh, this, this this stuff just arrives via the U.S. mail. Go look at the size of these warehouses. We are doing this to ourselves. The, like, it's unbelievable how big they are. They are 24 hours. They are a machine out there that is bringing you stuff you maybe don't need. The other one that killed me, you know, inside a little bit was the the um, livestock farms. Oh, my gosh. They are huge. I, we can't go there right now, but like we 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 can't because Christy will start crying and that will be. Oh, I want to cry right now. No, like it hurt me to see. And there's, it's capitalism. Both those things, same root cause, mm -hmm. same problem. So yeah, no, I it was very upsetting. And to bring it to like bring it all back is like we can, back. we can choose differently. Like yes. we can choose oh, yeah. and we can evolve individually and collectively. I mean, my theory of change is that we have to evolve collectively in order for any of this to make any kind of impact. Agreed. But we can start with our own individual evolution. Yes. To say like, enough is enough. Yes. And to go back to that thing where we can, you and I both in this last year have for sure said, I'm calling bullshit on this story that I've been telling myself. And I would say we can also collectively do that for these capitalist ideas. If that's something that's hurting your heart, make a different choice. You don't have to follow along with what other people like this could be your evolution moment. Mm. <laughs> Well, I feel like that's a good place to like, let's talk about if somebody wants to see your brand new, beautiful website, tune in to your amazing podcast, which, okay, so I've heard some of it and it is good guys. Like you gotta, uh, it's, oh my goodness. So good. Where can they find you? Everyone can find me over at christytending.com. And again, there's the podcast, there's all sorts of resources to delight you. And um, if you found me through this show, like come say hi, I'm on email and Instagram, like come say hi. I'm really not scary. Um, totally the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get a little strident, but I'm really not scary. I promise you. <laughs> so do come say hi. Uh, do check out the podcast. Super excited to hear what you all are going to think of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a major labor of love. And I want to take this moment to thank you, Paula, for all of your help with it. You're so welcome. It's it's an honor and a privilege to see it come to life and to see how much you, you've you poured your heart into it. And it, yeah, the world needs it. So I am honored and delighted that to have been a part of it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, anything, any last words of wisdom you'd like to leave people with or? Oh my gosh. I, I, I don't, I have no words of wisdom. Like go love yourselves and each other. Be free. <laughs> Be free. That's all I got. Like my, my teacher, my teacher, no, I'll leave you with this one story. My teacher, Sylvia Borstein, I was studying with her a couple of days ago and she was saying, look, all we're doing is having the same insight over and over again. We're just understanding it a little bit better each time. Mm. There's no advanced mindfulness class and it's because the instructions are the same every time. Pay attention, meet what's there with compassion. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any extra words of wisdom. Like it's this, it's all the same teaching. <laughs> <laughs> We're all having the same insights over and over again. And really all I've got for you is love yourselves, love each other, go be free. Thank you so much for being on, Christy. You're the literal best. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. 
What a delight and a treat to have you back. Thank you so much for joining me again, Christy. I love these conversations that we have and also very much appreciate being your friend and getting to co-work with you. If you guys want to find out more about this episode, you can find the show notes at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash evolve. There's the links to her, to our past five episodes with Christy. I have also linked over to her new podcast, which is so good and totally worth a listen. And you can find all of that in those show notes. So for next week, I am really, really excited to have my friend, Sister Michelle Lallier. She is a Franciscan nun, and we met many years ago when I was leading retreats at San Damiano Retreat in Danville, California. She and I share a birthday and a personality type, (laughs) which is such a delight. And I love that she will be the last guest of season four. It feels so very appropriate to have her on. And we talk so much about spirituality, Franciscan theology, and how you can dive into that more spiritual side of yourself and take a deeper look at what it means to be a spiritual person in today's world. I think you're going to love this conversation so much, and I am delighted to share it with you. So I hope you'll come on back for that next week for episode 199. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy. 